Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, definitely appreciate the compliment. I'm not sure it's deserved in my case because I've only been there for a year and a half. I'm just building on the shoulders of the giants that I get to work with. Um, so Chris told me I should ex disclose up front that uh, these two are both clients. So you know that. We still pay you? Uh, yeah. Well, Pivotal doesn't yet. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. Fix that. Pivotal doesn't. Okay. So, so I'm not a client. VMware is a client. Yeah, that's right. Pivotal <laughs> hasn't given us any money yet. Red, Red Hat is Red a client. Gigaspaces is not a client. Um, so take, take that as you will, right? If, if you feel like my questions are biased, maybe that's why. Um, I'll try my best, but you know. I'll also, if you have any ideas for questions you want to hear during the panel, tweet them at me. I will check it. Uh, I don't have a T in my last name, but other than that, it's D. Burkholz. And I'll, if, if I'm looking at my phone, it's not because they're boring me. It's, it's because I'm checking to see if you guys have any input. Because um, I want this to be as interactive as possible, not just me spouting or them spouting for the next 45 minutes. Um, so that said, uh, we should probably do some quick intros. Does anybody, first of all, not know any of these people? Or not know at least one of them? Everybody knows everybody except for like three? All right. So for the benefit of you guys, um, you guys each have two minutes to introduce yourselves. And no marketing stuff. Uh, so I'm Nati Shalom, I'm the CTO and founder of Gigaspaces. Uh, Gigaspaces is basically uh, doing uh, what's now known as ops work uh, using an open source product named uh, Cloudify. I'm Diane Mueller. Um, I'm working with Red Hat and working on the OpenShift Origin community development. I'm their cloud ecosystem evangelist and um, a bit of a pause queen. I'm James Waters. I work on the Cloud Foundry project at now Pivotal. We just spun out of VMware. Excellent. So my first question, we'll start with the audience because you guys are more important than I am. Um, I was talking to Adrian Cockrapp before this, and one of the things he pointed out was that you know, the real value of a, a pass or a pause or however you want to pronounce it is the abstraction it gives you. Um, and in an open source pass, you have the ability to reach around that abstraction to do things that the pass isn't giving you. So how is that affecting you know, developers' productivity and their capability? Do you think it's a, it's a benefit or a problem? Um, why don't we start with you, Nadi? Yeah, so first of all, I think there is this notion that if your platform is open source, then people are actually going to hack it and use it and, and understand the source code behind it. And uh, the reality is that only very few people actually look at the source code and, and hack it, and only when it, it's actually uh, necessary. Uh, so I think that when you design an open source, you don't design necessarily that people will hack it or change it. You design it so that if people would be uh, at the point where they need to change things, they wouldn't be dependent on you. And they would be able to do that. But generally speaking, they should be able to do most of the things out of the box with the platform itself. That's the, that's the right way to design the, uh, even an open source product. A lot, there is a lot of other reasons why you would you use the open source. And uh, to your question, I don't think that today in middleware space, people would consume any product that is not open source. So uh, to m in my view, there is no real options of not using an open source product to get into enterprise space or to get any, into any middleware game at all. So I'd like to add a little bit around the de design principles for PAS as in terms of the abstraction. Um, one of there's in the separation in the PAS architecture of the core concepts, the, the, the routers and the servers and the controllers and all of the good stuff that um, manages all, all of that. That, that pr in principle, is one, one layer of abstraction. But the design principle between, behind many of the pauses, a couple of them appear, is to also allow to the extensibility to add in, like with Heroku build packs or OpenShift cartridges, the ability to add new functionality into the PAS without affecting the core. Uh, so I think in the open source world, there's two, two sections of the community that we're building around the platform as a service, is that there's a lot of extensions to OpenShift um, and Origin that allow people to add new functionality and new um, frameworks and new databases and all those things using the cartridge metaphor, which there's another metaphor for in Cloud Foundry that um, allows for an extensibility to the PAUSE framework while the PAUSE architecture itself remains a stable um, abstraction to the developer. Does that make sense? 
Okay. James, you got anything to add? Sure. I think my pragmatic response there would be that uh, sometimes when a developer that's using us starts hacking on us and adding things, it's an indication to me that there's a white space there that we could actually work on as a feature. Yeah. And so the most useful thing for me is that iteration cycle of what do we work on next. Uh, so we currently don't have a highly unified logging system within Cloud Foundry. A lot of people are trying to do that on their own today. Mm -hmm. um, the build pack was a good example of people wanted an actual interface for hacking on, made it, make it more modular. Uh, so I actually view developers hacking on or changing things and changing the abstractions as a good leading indicator of where we need to think of adding a unified feature. Mm -hmm. Um, unless there are highly divergent use cases where you have very specific kind of monitoring for a certain stack, et cetera, that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you actually made the point I was thinking of making, so thank you for doing that. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, that's brilliant. The less I have to say, the better. This is about you guys, not me. Um, so, you know, kind of building on that, I mean, something we saw with Heroku and specifically with the, the whole Rap Genius thing was one of the problems was a lack of transparency into what's actually happening. Um, I feel like open source gives you an opportunity for perhaps more transparency and certainly the ability to actually fix any problems you encounter um, instead of having to wait for them to be fixed. Um, do you feel like that's, have you, have you encountered that personally? Um, have you ever received fixes for significant problems with your platform like that? Or do you feel like that's not a major issue whether you're open or closed, it's all the same? I think being in an open source environment and where you're collaborating and you have a community of people giving you feedback, finding the bug fixes, that you're more li likely to um, find and hear about um, the issues sooner than when, as in with the Rap Genius and Heroku thing, it gets resolved a lot quicker because it's, there's a much more vibrant um, forum for people to communicate back and forth about those kinds of issues. And I, I very much doubt if that issue had been in openshift.com or cloudfoundry.com that it would have taken that long to rise to the surface. It would have been caught much sooner. Yeah, I mean, we had a, a user, I don't know who's active on our mailing list, but Ken, you might have seen this, where someone said there's a, a message you can send to a DEA that just kills it. You remember that guy found that bug and people were talking about that? That was awesome. Like, people found a problem in our system. That transparency really helped us. But the Heroku situation, I think you've got to put your brain on and say, who's going to commit a patch that gives you shared state routing on the front end? Like, that's a really hard problem. So I don't think you can just push a little commit that gives you shared state across you know, all of your routers so that you can do ordering, et cetera. I don't know that Netflix runs shared state. Uh, I think they just use ELBs, which do not have that. Um, so I wouldn't want to over-advertise open as some sort of panacea to fix that problem. Yes, I think the issue of transparency is, is extremely important, uh, not just for the case in which people want to, again, hack things or, or change things. It's also understanding how things work so that they can design things correctly. So if you're building something on top of any platform that is not open source, it's much harder to know how it behaves and how it works correctly. And therefore, everything that you build on top of that may be just be a, you know, a tower of cards that could collapse on certain situations. So, and, and there is no way in which you can document all those assumptions. And in many cases, when you document things, you, you, want, you actually want to hide the complex things, or you want to hide things that you might be, uh, want to be shy about. And where in open source, there is no such option. Uh, it's all transparent, and people can actually use this open source in many cases as a documentation source, especially developers. And therefore, that helps them not to change things, but to understand how to build things on top of that and to build it correctly with the right assumptions. In certain cases, we've encountered areas where, uh, and, and again, you gave the uh, Uroco example. I think during all the discussion, we talked about not just transparency, but also the extensibility, how much you can extend things. So one way in which you could extend, like in the case of Uroco, is that you could you know, open the source, change things, and deploy it. The, the risk there, that's why I thought that this is not the right pattern, is that you're bec becoming a fork, and therefore, every change that you're making is actually breaking the ability to adopt new versions of the product. So even though open source allows you to do that, most people wouldn't be encouraged to do that or wouldn't be doing it. Uh, there are certain plugins that you have in place or certain areas in which you're allowed to do that in a, in a way that wouldn't break the compatibility with new versions. Uh, so in our case, for example, there is such thing that is called cloud driver or storage driver or network driver. This will allow you to actually uh, plug in other things uh, easily. Okay. Um, so. 
Something that ties into that that uh, Dave McCrory just pinged me about and I already had on my list as well. So You could have just talked, Dave. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's like 50 people here. But it's the internet. We need to. <laughs> yeah, but we can tweet. We can look all at our phones and computers and talk to each other that way. <laughs> we could have this whole debate on That's Twitter. how remote working is, you know. So anyway, the point is, though, I'm not exactly sure about the details of all your governance models, although maybe many of you already are. So something that I'm personally curious about, and maybe hopefully you are as well, is could you quickly summarize your governance models, but then also more importantly talk about some of the problems they've created and some of the benefits you've had from having it the way you do? Well, I'll hit that one. I think all of us are Apache V2 licenses that are up here on the stage right now. So all of us are, are using the same model for licensing the software. Um, at the, on the Origin project, uh, we have a merit meritocracy. Um, we have committers, uh, people who are contributors. There's a whole wiki-based um, listing of our governance processes that are, on, that are on the site. So we've really tried very hard to have it be based on your contribution, and that's where you get the credit for, and keeping that model very open and, and the process. Who's in control? Is it a person or a group of people? It's a, it's a group of people. Okay. It's a group of the contributors that are, that are So it is actually like an Apache Foundation project and not just an Apache license? In, yeah, in some, some aspects of it, yes. Okay. And I think then there are also um, be, there are different levels and subgroups, um, people who work on um, cartridges and reviewing the, the process, the code submissions for, for cartridges versus core. So there's a whole level of okay. a little bit of bureaucracy in there in the process, but it's a very transparent process. Okay. And then problems, benefits? Well, I think some of the benefits, some of it is still, even though we're Red Hat, we're still educating our customers that um, people who are using OpenShift.com and OpenShift Enterprise, that they too have a, a say in what goes in Origin, which is the underlying product that upstream feeds. Okay, so, but you're, you're just talking benefits of open source as a whole. But how about benefits of your governance model versus other open source governance models? Like, say, Linux kernel model. Yeah, so, so we're very close to using the same as the Fedora model and the, having a community around it, Fedora and JBoss and Gluster and, and those. So we're modeling ourselves in the origin community on this on the similar one to that. Um, the community is growing. It's, it's an interesting um, aspect of seeing them work on the governance models themselves and, and work through it. So it's not like I'm the benevolent dictator for life or anything like that. We don't right. have one in our model. Right. I mean, something specific that comes up you know, when you've got a committee is it slows things down, right? Especially if you require unanimous consent or at least nobody to, to adamantly disagree enough to keep arguing about it. Yeah. Um, has that been a problem at all? Not yet. Um, I think in terms of the, the, re the code reviews and the processes that are in place right now, um, the folks that are contributing and committing um, are doing a pretty good job of keeping that fluid and moving it forward. So is the decision making then does everybody have to agree for something to happen? It doesn't have to have 100%. No, not yet. OK, so rough consensus? Rough consensus okay. gets it in. And someone who's with the good skill levels is in a trusted committer and contributor has access to commit. OK. Um, I have nothing to add. You have nothing to add? I mean, you, in you, general. So what is your governance model? I like? mean, it's in, in, we're in a different stage uh, from, a, I would say, evolution perspective from a community size of things. So I don't think that we're still at the point where we do need to have a lot of contributions mm -hmm. uh, managed uh, formally. Uh, right now, the level of contribution is still at a very, fairly low level, to be honest. Um, so that the governance process is done by a community manager that is accepting the uh, pools and uh, push requests to, uh, to our source code. And, and that's pretty much how it's managed. Uh, so I think that, you know, if we'll get to the point where there's going to be a lot of those requests, we'll need a more formal process. But right now, that's not necessary. So I, I don't think that we're in the same stage. Yeah, I think we're just migrating towards the more Fedora, JBoss model. OK. And so you're at the point where you haven't really had to scale your process yet to cope with the bigger community? Yes. I think that's, OK. My side? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Club Foundry's actually been um, really popular with a lot of big vendors. So um, we've gone out and actively recruited an ecosystem from the start. Uh, so I think governance is actually more, much more of a hotter topic for us. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're taking a look at. I think when I study the market, I see really strong success from things like Redis and Puppet and Chef and Nginx and all these very fast moving, what you might call benevolent dictator, autonomous 
kind of open source, but you know, directed professional source community like JBoss was. JBoss was very much a we're professional open source group, we're not a community. Uh, I think the reason that people are also interested in exploring other sides for Cloud Foundry is it's a potential standardization of the app deployment layer and of the app binding layer. Um, and those are just so important to so many big companies that I think that they kind of want to be involved in some way. So we're getting lots and lots of calls. And people are asking to quietly put committers on the project right now without kind of coming out publicly. Um, and it's something to keep a close eye on because I think at the end of the day, we want to write great software for developers, uh, not necessarily have a lot of meetings. But uh, right. I think when you, you are successful, you do get that burden. Right. So in, in all of your cases, would an external developer who wanted to contribute be treated the same as an employee? Or in do they go through something different? In our case, it's a, it's a meritocracy. So as you contribute to code reviews and, and submit bugs and fixes and you earn your stripes, you do become, and we have customers and folks that are becoming committers now. And you also have Red Hat employees who have not yet become committers? Oh yeah, hello, I'm one. So in our case, uh, we even give more higher priority to, to committers that are external to, than developers internal, yeah. just to encourage you know, more people to, to do that type of thing. So, mm -hmm. so in a way, when someone is committing something, uh, obviously if it's, it's valuable, then it's actually getting higher in the priority list. And usually if he's putting an effort around that, it's going to be part of the priority list at the higher rank than, uh, than other things. In, in order to build a really a good open community, you have to recognize the, recognize the con contributions that people are making and give them a say in the, in the way the project is going. Mm -hmm. It's an unsolved problem, so I think you know, there's good data here, but it's, it's not a defin definitive answer yet on which works best, and it's usually pretty idiosyncratic to each community of what works for them. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, th there's a lot of you know benefits and problems to each side, and it's just and it's not specific to PaaS per se, right? I think there are some parts of it that are and aren't. But oh, absolutely not. I mean, it's it's one of those issues that like the Hadoop community, for example, has been going through because they are an Apache model, sure. and they've got multiple companies all trying to say we're in control and we are the Hadoop company, um, and so there's there's a lot of <coughs> issues with the the committee approach when there's competing companies all trying to be the all stars. And I think the thing that we have to recognize is a lot of open source projects fail, you know, when you, over governance issues, over a lack of commitment, and all kinds of reasons. But, you know, it's a really evolving um, model, and you really have to flex with and adapt with the community that's working on your project. And as long as you recognize the con contributions that people are making, you'll have success. All right. Um, so let's flip to talk more about. Oh, hey, you've got your hand up. Yeah. yeah. Like really almost every company is an open source. There are more than 1,000 very clear projects on Apache. And the people are finite. Uh, why do you think uh, all of them will be successful? Because it seems like whenever I go to any conference, everybody thinks they are successful. So tell me, what is this for the developer to be on a certain platform? And are you seeing competing against other projects? If so, what do you do? So the question is, is uh, what would make one open source successful than others, uh, given that there is many competing open source projects on the same? There are only 10 people, and the projects are 100. Why are you able to attract those? Because what I've seen is the lead developers are pretty and not developers, and they're making almost two times more money than So that's a black hole. Yeah, sure. So really simply, we pay over 50 engineers to work full time on this, and we take contributions from other large organizations that have the money to do the same. Well, this is not a mendicant model of open source where we're going out and saying, hey, we have a concept, but no engineering to put behind it. So we're, we're not looking for contributions for manpower. We're looking at contributions in terms of you run into a new problem that you can help us understand faster. That's where it really helps is articulating that white space and that problem space where we need to go solve it and having some running code as an example of how to get there. I think what you'll, you'll see, too, is that there are finite resources, and that's one of the reasons why open source works, is because everybody in closed proprietary sure systems is. realizes sure. that a group of eight, eight or nine even genius developers aren't going to be able to do the same work as a community of 50 or 100 or 300 people, and that's really the crux of why open source works. So though there is a demand for open source developers to volunteer their time, 
most of us, like Red Hat, um, on the OpenStack project and on OpenShift Origin and other uh, Fedoras, we all do invest heavily in uh, engineering resources that we put to task to work on these open source projects and welcome other and that's, companies. That's by no means specific to pass either. I mean, no. even if you look at the Linux kernel, which is a famous example of open source, you know, volunteer development at the start, is now I think 80 to 90 percent paid people who work oh, yeah. on it who make those that many commits, that many lines of code, um, yeah. and so on. Um, so James suggested that we take your question. Well, he he's a PaaS engineer from a customer. Yeah, so our team has heavily adopted the cloud foundry, and it's it's a huge resource to have. They they have dedicated teams that work on the core components of it. And when we find peripherals that we need to add to the core enterprise, it's easier than to just adopt those and slap those in there. And if we find specific areas that maybe you know a bug or some use case, it's easy for us to to add those. No. You guys are especially active, and we appreciate it. And a lot of your comments have gone straight into our product backlog. So we've, we see it from you and a couple other people. We're like, that's a feature. We put it in our agile backlog, and we act on it within two months. Right. And I feel like that's a major benefit that open source passes have, is yeah. just the nature of how they're used to behaving as an open source community, which is being very responsive and very public and very, I mean, it's release early, release often, right, yep. is the open source mantra. And the same applies to the community. Um, so I feel like it's not. You know, a requirement that you be open source to do that, but open source passes have a benefit because they're used to behaving that way. Yeah. And I think it's also the transparency of the mailing lists and the forums. As you see if a bug is lagging or sitting there for months and no one's responding, you obviously know that there, there's an issue and there, there's not enough resources on it or something. So that's it's also core to an open source project. You, if you do that in a proprietary closed sense, it's just not, there isn't the collaboration or the passion there. The other thing that you get too is you get customers that can also ask questions. So whereas if you're with the vendor, it's a way for vendors. All right. Yeah, and that's that's just transparency in general. That's you know, it doesn't you don't have to be open source for that either. Yeah. Um, but it's not often that you see a, a closed source vendor with an IRC chat, for example. Yeah, well, I think well. IRC is a really great example too, because you can hop on an IRC channel and half the time the, the questions are answered by somebody outside of Red Hat. Uh, and it's it's just phenomenal, and we learn from what they're talking about on there and add. Right. Um, so another question that I had, and I think Dave had as well. Dave has lots of questions, which is great. Um, is what kind of pushback are you getting from your potential customers on being open source? Zero. Yeah. There, there's no. I think the pushback on open source is, is a legacy thing. It's not really. Yeah, is this a straw man debate we're having up here? Yeah. Is there anyone who's against open source paths really. other than Sinclair, who has a couple customers? <laughs> anyone against open source paths out easy, here? Yeah. I just want to make sure we're debating something that matters. <laughs> I mean, there are customers who know this enterprise who still are not comfortable with certain types of open. In their development environments? No. They're, not, they're using Java, which is open source. They're using I mean, Python. It, come on. Let's be really clear here. There's all sorts of different types of open source. You have to be I just think we should have an important pointed debate about something that people disagree on versus like all going, yeah, open source good for 45 more minutes. But, but Paz is also, Paz is Tell me if I'm wrong. Well, I mean, you'd presume that if everybody here thinks open source is good, all the passes would be open. So all licenses are equal, right? Chris just promised me a panel on value. That's all. He did. <laughs> so I want to point out that uh, it's, not, it's not as easy as it No, but I, I think James made a, a good point. This, you, you make good I was talking. I was pointing to that, James. You do make good I, points. I know that James is contrary to. I just want to make sure. There are other Jameses in the world. Now this is the interesting that, conversation because you got to bring IT together, which is used to closed source products that are very networking policy centric, together with a developer framework which has no idea of networks. And how do you stitch all that together? That's what keeps me up at night. That's that's a topic I'd love to debate. Right, and that's one where I sort of say, you know, that, I mean, not that I see a lot of evidence that's a huge pushback to to, uh, to open source in general in that way anyway, because I don't think operations understands what PaaS does for operations yet to the point that they should. They get infrastructure as a service to a certain extent now, 
There's a VM lending to get. Yeah. They don't quite get paths yet. And I think that that's, you know, that's a, you know, another interesting aspect of the question then is, is you know, when it comes to um, when it comes to licenses that are friendly to ongoing running of applications, things that are going to be there for five years, things that are going to have to be patched, they have to be that are contained in ways other than the developer wrote the code. Um, you know, are are there in, are, are we seeing any objective? Are we seeing a acknowledged knowledgeable acceptance of open source as in that space? You know, is there, that's where we would expect to see more pushback is from IT ops team saying, "Well, wait a minute, you're gonna you're gonna configure my network on the fly via an API without me." knowing exactly what policies you have in place? I don't think so. Yeah, I want to comment on two things. I think that there is a question about openness in which open source is a component of, and I think that we haven't discussed that because most of the question was pretty generic to open source that is not necessarily related to, to pass, and I think that that's, that's what the point I was trying that you're to trying to say, yeah. And in openness, there is different things, and open source is part of that, and, and to your question with regard to how enterprises or you know customers that are more security savvy and other things would look at open source and certain license of open source. Then what I'm seeing, and we've been very much targeting enterprises. Uh, we're coming from enterprise world, financial services, all those security guys uh, uh, savvy. And what I'm seeing is a, is a huge shift. And I would say that we have a proprietary product that is not open source, and we came to an open source product because we really find that. If you really want to sell to enterprises today, you can't even sell if it's not open source. And I'm talking about the Bank of America or the world. I'm talking about you know all those big names that you would look as legacy that doesn't look at open source necessarily as a positive thing. If you would look at their agenda today and how they approach cloud, uh, similar to what you heard in Intel, maybe uh, you know a little bit backward thinking, but still going in that path, they would look at open source as the model in which they want to develop things. Because I think they're all coming to to the model where they realize that's really the right things to do, especially if you're talking about at the upper layer of the stack, because at the upper layer of the stack, the, the, even the notion that you would be able to define interfaces or API for all the use cases is, is impossible. And therefore, you have to have that openness. And that brings me to the point of openness, which in which uh, I think the entire discussion here was missing that point that even an open source is not enough. Yeah. Uh, openness is, is, is what people are looking for. And the reasons why I think paths haven't been adopted so far and still, and even though we're talking about past, I don't know, since the beginning of, of cloud discussions. I've had a great first month of selling. I don't know about you. I've had an amazing first month of selling. I'm so charged up. Like customers like him are using it. We're just, we're just having a great time. I'm saying that if you look at the workload in cloud today, and you look at the entire machines that are using in cloud, and I'm not talking about Cloud Foundry specific, and the amount of application that, I, that runs on pass versus the amount of application that runs on IaaS, bare metal, or sorry, not bare metal, but directly on bare metal, you'll find that most of the workload, most of the machine that runs on Amazon doesn't run on, uh, on pass today, right? There is a reason for that. And that's what I'm talking about. So relatively speaking, I'm not talking about absolute terms. Yeah. Relatively speaking, the adoption of pass uh, compared to where people would want it to be or where they think it should be is smaller than what people would think it would be. And the reason why is that because of that lack of openness, the thing that people are discussing today, that you're lacking a container, and that if you want to hack a container, if you want to run your app, there, you have limited options on what you could run in that, in that containerized model. And in most cases, you'll find that most of those applications, 90% of that would be web apps, and not all of the applications are web apps in the world. That's why I'm talking about openness. So it's not necessarily how much you sell and how much you, you have an adoption. I, and I, I believe know, you that you, I do, you, you do have a, a, a great first month or whatever. Uh, but relatively speaking, if you really look at the workload, the numbers speak differently. Yeah. Relatively speaking, OK. Well, I, was just, I was just going to Go interject here, too. I think what, what it, what's actually evolving is that, in some ways, pause is an artificial separation in the cloud. It's that, um, what we're moving towards, and I think Daz said it this morning um, in terms of a hybrid service model where you have the IIS and a PaaS and SaaS and you have a, a more of an open cloud, federated cloud, and hopefully it won't take till 2014 to get there. And the PaaS layer, 
and I'm hoping that in two to two years or three years that we're, we're not saying pause and IaaS and we're just saying open cloud and we're running our applications. We'll still have deploy cons, so don't worry, Krish. Um, we'll still be deploying applications, but the whole metaphor for what we're doing and, and the tools that we use will be just part and parcel of an open cloud and a federated and a much more interoperable cloud. So you know, that, that I think is where we're moving towards. We don't have that cross-cloud interoperability yet, but we're getting there. You sounded like you wanted to add something before. It you know, sounded right? like apple pie to me. I like tough design trade-offs. Like, to me, I haven't heard, I'd love to hear how you guys think about connecting together you know, network policy with application deployment. I think that's a tough debate to have. Right. I've run into that at a couple customers where the IT side of the house said, don't you just want VM orchestration? And the developer side of the house revolted and said, no, we're using this PaaS thing. We want it. Like, be it Cloud Foundry, whatever. Like, I'm not saying they were just huge Cloud Foundry fanboys. They just wanted an interactive layer versus a workflow layer. And they're, they're, they're two different things. Yeah. Um, but that's a cultural thing, too, within the, within the IT. And most organizations have been built. I would even say this room, my one frustration would be there's not enough kind of, like, developers in the room, right? There's a lot of, like, people are, like, IT up like trying to imagine that PaaS is just another IT orchestration play, and it's not. I think there's a lot of plays out there right now that are very much IT up orchestration, and there's very few framework down plays. Um, yeah, I, I want to touch on that because I think that's really an area where I, I pretty much just feel the same pain, where most of the application was written on top of an infrastructure as if it was a black box, and the infrastructure was written as if the application is a black box. And, and I actually think, see that as an opportunity. And there is a public case study which was done with Alcatel, for example, which is a network operator, not, not a network operator, a network vendor, an ISV, who was able to plug in uh, a pass in his product, which couldn't be done, by the way, without an open source model, and plug in the network into that. And plug in the network, and, and again, attaching to uh, the uh, talk from Intel, how do you run an application well across geographies, across uh, private and public cloud, hybrid clouds? Today you have to point to, you know, this is the node that runs here, and I think you've seen this blueprint. This is the node that runs here, this is where the, the global load balancer sits, this is the other nodes, and this is how they connect, and this is how they set up the replication, versus this is my application, it needs to have disaster recovery enabled, and the latency between the disaster recovery side needs to, needs to be X, and the ge geography distance between them needs to be Y, and the infrastructure actually knows that information. It knows where the compute resources fits there and where the compute resources are there, and I can actually talk to that using SLA-driven approach versus an explicit API that says, run this stuff here, run this stuff here, and availability zone here, and availability zones, and geography here, and geography here, and load bonds here, and load bonds there, there. I need to know all that network capabilities outside of the application and kind of embedded in the application. So to your point, I think that the ability to integrate a lot of that infrastructure knowledge into the application, that's where the big openness piece that is missing that can be done and, and is done uh, partially today. Yeah, I think what we're doing right now is we're, we're having people having to manage in two different places. At the infrastructure level, there's an, an opening in the PaaS level, and, that, and that's the convergence that I see is going to have to happen, and, and part of what we're working towards with OpenShift and OpenStack and creating a converged cloud. We're really trying, it's a, it hasn't been solved yet. I think it's still a, a conundrum out there that we've, we've got to work on and make it work on any cloud too. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, uh, of course, the honor software that is, uh, is good, but you know, from, like, from your point of view, definitely you guys are making compromises when it comes to the functionality that the uh, hardware vendors are providing you because the fact that there are different hardware is still running as the last decades uh, architectures. If one thing you would like to get done in the hardware, uh, maybe at the CPU level, maybe at the independent level, you can talk to you. I think that the thing that I'm seeing that is happening is the uh, accessibility through API. Uh, you can see that across the board storage, non-network, uh, quantum, for example, in the case of uh, OpenStack and others. So the first thing that needs to happen in order that the layer of the application would be able to integrate better, as James mentioned, with the layer of the infrastructure is that everything in the infrastructure needs to be exposed to the API. The void that exists up until now is that we had an API for storage, we had an API for compute, but we, we didn't have an API for network, and I think that's the next big wave, I think, where the integration will happen. Yeah. I was trying to get more is like, Intel for Clipboard, uh, 
macro into the CPU. Uh, like they want that whole uh, code that was running in the in the software there, they put it as an instruction set in, in the CPU. That's the reason for it. Virtualization performance is almost as good as their macro. So I'm thinking from the same perspective, what would you like Intel to do or ARM or to do to put something in the instruction set that would make your life very easy? Uh, I think the instruction set sounds to me as a fairly low level uh, for integration. I disagree. I totally disagree. I totally disagree with you. No, I disagree with you completely. I think that you have to go with dominant designs that are already out there. I think the whole point of infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, you take existing behaviors that are already very common, be they Ethernet, VMs, all these things, Java, JVM, you take all these things that are super popular and you, you put a nice process around that to make them happen in a more efficient way. <laughs> I'm being hard because these people challenge the crowd, so I'm I, challenging the crowd. I think that might be a little low level to innovate. I, I don't know. I, I mean, the other point too, though, is that I guess this is at least in theory the open source pass panel, and I'm not quite sure how that pertains. Um, so maybe that's a more appropriate question to ask another panel. I, I would say that uh, if you look for data points, look at what Amazon is doing, and uh, we all assume that it, it, when Amazon introduced a new feature or new capabilities in that platform, it's because of a demand, not because someone came in with an idea and said it's a cool thing, let's do it. Uh, so if you look at what they've done, they've done uh, three major things that I think everyone has seen. One of them is the cloud formation, which is the, if you'd like, the automation piece. The other one is they came up with all those pass layers, um, the containerized pass, uh, Elastic Beans, talk, and, and so forth. And recently they came up with OpsWorks, uh, which is the void in between, which is the area where we're playing as well. So if you look at that, and if you look at what they're doing, they're basically doing it based on a demand. And, and you can see the data points uh, from coming from Amazon, why they've done those things. Uh, so I think that in, it, in itself is a, is a clear indication of a demand and people are using it in certain ways. And what we're seeing in the entire cloud industry is that whatever Amazon is doing, the rest of the industry is trying to replicate to other environments. And that's kind of the trend that is happening. And obviously the rest of the environments, the rest of the, the, the cloud world, if you like, is lagging behind Amazon and that. <laughs> I'm just saying that very Amazon wants something about open shift or not open shift, red shift. In just a matter of weeks, it was a runaway success. And if they were rebranding on Excel, and that is called success. We put it out, people grab it, and you don't have to promote anything. What, what they did right versus you know, what they are not doing. All right, we, we, we really need to move on because this is very questionably relevant to an open source session. So I know you had a question that why don't we I'm just going to make a comment. We, we've had wild success with the ability to abstract the instructions here from the applications here. We lived in this world where everything was the VM. Yeah. I was the center of the universe. It, it took like, I mean, it took so much inertia to get over that. But once your organization gets over that and it's an the universe, I mean, to have that abstracted, it, it just allows your community to get you this liberty. It, it changes the whole model it's, it's, for development. It's, it's what he said. <laughs> yeah. And if you wanted data, I can give you data too. There's a survey of uh, 700,000 instances running on Amazon. Their average utilization was only 20%. People are willing to pay a large inefficiency price to get speed and abstraction today. So that's why I argue against your point that you need to, you know, microarchitecture improvements to make things more efficient. People really want the abstraction as yeah. he is. Was he's this the NuVem study? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. a good yeah. one. You should check it out. Yeah. So if you wanted data, there you go. So, um, something that's interesting to me that pertains to James's point about um, the sort of battle between the ops and the dev sides is which side are you having luck selling to? And you know, do you have to teach them to fight through ops? What are you teaching them to do? I, I actually, I'll, I'll just speak from my very recent experience because I've been with Red Hat all of a month. But most of what we're seeing is coming in from um, there's, there's two channels. The, the public pause, openshift.com side, those are the developers coming, they're, they're launching their apps, 
they're having success, and then they're turning around and going to their IT ops side, and, and it's the IT ops that are actually buying software and implementing it. So it's, the, it's, it's a developer-driven adoption cycle in some ways, but as soon as um, they, they flip the switch and they have some success, it's all be, being driven by in, internally. The, the revenue side of it's all IT ops. Yeah, so, so I think that uh, we're now moving towards DevOps small world, where I think the IT as the traditional IT that we used to think that is you know, uh, risk averse and don't think about any change is, is a risk, uh, is shifting. Okay, it's not there yet, but it's shifting. Uh, we heard, again, Intel today, I've heard others talking about that. So what you're seeing is actually uh, two camps driving the change, both from the IT and from the ops. Uh, and it depends on the organization who is the main driving, who is the champion who is driving that. In some organization, it would be the ops guys who are feeling the pain and feeling that the IT is a blocker in the process and they're driving the change, but they need to drive the change across the organization because obviously you can't really get to the point where an app is in production in a day without having both groups aligned. Uh, and in some organization, you'll see that the IT are actually realizing that you know it's, it's, it's not they cannot fight that war any, anywhere and they have to adopt and therefore they are driving that change. And I'm seeing that in some enterprises as well. And in that case, they're actually making the applications align with them. So it really depends. I haven't seen uh, you know, the traditional discussions where developers understand DevOps and they would be driving DevOps and IT are the stupid guys that want to keep the world you know, years ago and, and, and so forth. I'm seeing both changes happening in both uh, areas of the, of the spectrum. I think we should be really specific, though. So I'd like to ask a really pointed question, which is how do you guys deal with network resource pools when you install your product? Does your product have an awareness of a network? And how does it have awareness of networks today? Yeah, so in our case, it's, uh, it's basically we have zones, uh, uh, capabilities. We can tag uh, machines based on their network affinity. Okay. And when you deploy an application or service within a cluster, for example, for availability, you could say that this service needs uh, redundancy and those redundant resources doesn't have to, need not to run on the same network, will know how to match the deployment to those different zones so that they wouldn't run on the same network or they wouldn't run on the same data center, they wouldn't run that. All that orchestrations happen uh, on, in runtime. We don't have to actually change it in, in, in physical modes. So, that's, so, the, so, so we expose the ability of tagging machines based on affinity uh, and expose that to the orchestration there. So a similar approach is used in deploying OpenShift, either the OpenShift Enterprise or Origin, in terms of exposing it in, at the when you deploy the cluster, you assign the where you're going to put the different nodes, and the, the system knows where it's going to be deployed in. But um, it's not totally. Um, yeah, because that's like a big difference between our projects. Like we have the whole Bosch layer, which mm -hmm. provisions infrastructure as well, like it provisions VMs and networks and all these other things, and then you can connect it to what gets put on top of it, and that's like a key layer for us in terms of helping bridge the gap between what IT wants and what the developers want. So I, I, I don't know enough about the other two projects. Yeah, so I, I think that what we, we've done is use Chef or Puppet, whatever the enterprises is using, as opposed to the Bosch approach. So they're, most of it's done in scripting with, with Chef and Puppet and automation that way. Yeah, I think it's, there's at least a thesis out there that the scripting approach is maybe more flexible, but it's also maybe more fragile and brittle, and it won't actually be able to connect policy up. I don't know if James Urquhart's kind of an expert in this stuff. <laughs> you want me to, to drag me into this? Sure. No, I think, um, I think it's important to separate concerns, and I think there's application operations, there's service operations, the writing of the path itself, and then there's the applications that run on top of it. And I think the infrastructure has to offer capability, and so, frankly, most of the paths today um, that when they're installed, there's a lot of decisions that are made at install time about yeah. how the underlying infrastructure is mapped into the system. Things like Bosch, things like Stratus used with a past environment, are things that can actually be brought in to automate some of those decision making things and even change them over time. But that's not perfect solution either at this point in time. Um, ideally, I would think that the cert everybody's service up here is going to, as the APIs around networking get better, better. Yep. which is now only just now happening. Uh, things like quantum are, are kind of, you know, looking for things to consume, mm -hmm. right? It's truth of the matter. Uh, and I worked on quantum, so I can say that. Um, 
the, so the truth of the matter is, is that um, what's going to have to happen is the path layers are going to have to get smarter at runtime and making decisions about how to work with things like software-defined networking, open flow, you know, those kinds of things with um, dynamic routing, or at least signaling out things about the application that the service knows about that the infrastructure can react to in real time. Um, so today, it's not surprising that there's an awful lot of things with networks where people set up zones or they set up some sort of tagged networking structure, even if it's VLANs, and say, okay, I want to attach this node to this VLAN, or I want to attach this node to this tagged network environment, because there's really not a lot of choice. Um, in reality, though, that's going to be one of the really exciting things that PaaS can do in the long term to differentiate itself even more so from you know, pure resource serving infrastructure service and how that happens, composable versus contextual, as we talked about this morning, I think are the really, that's the really, really exciting next year, two year kind of development and research area as, as Cisco gets its act together, as Juniper gets its act together. Um, Al Lucent has some cool stuff in place already, but as they get stronger, um, how, how are you guys gonna take advantage of those APIs? And those capabilities and discover those capabilities and be able to do yeah. magical things for the application developers through that. Because today, frankly, all you can do is say, tell me what VLANs are out there and I'll tell the developers to talk to them. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the, the follow-up to that is how is being open source going to affect that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's open networking, right? I mean, yeah. so I do know the company that bought NYSERA pretty well. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, and, and there's, you know, there, there's, that's a great example of somebody who's probably you know, there's, there's a great opportunity there to be taken advantage of, and so, um, and, and there's, a, there's, you know, four or five other opportunities like that. I think the Cisco, new Cisco APIs are really interesting. There's some of the stuff that Juniper's been doing of late, um, uh, especially around security, are really interesting. Um, but, you know, but this is, this is to say that, you know, the separation of concerns remains really important. You don't want infrastructure decisions being made within the service environment. You don't want infrastructure operations happening within the service environment. What you want is the ability to communicate to the infrastructure to make a request. This is what I want. This is what I'd like the environment to be, and have that environment be operated separately in order to deliver that. Um, and a classic example of that is something like Heroku, where they they have from day one run on somebody else's infrastructure, where they have no control over that infrastructure, and all they can do is make that call through an API to ask for the infrastructure to be configured the way they want it to. And that's really where, you know, where I see a lot of it kind of moving. Yeah, I think that the ideal scenario would be that, I mean, we've all, we all seen the outages in Amazon, for example, in the past few years. A lot of them could have been uh, avoided if people could have developed the application for redundancy in the right way. But the reasons why they haven't developed it for the right redundancy is because it's complex. And if I take what you said about uh, the network and API and what would be the killer app, in a way, is that you could really build a robust application that could survive a lot of those added edge without developing a lot of frameworks around that. And all that knowledge of how you manage multi data center deployment would be done more implicitly because of that API integration, because you could actually make that more seamlessly than explicitly than you're doing right now. Yeah, and, th and that's where we're going in terms of the future right. of PaaS. It's not there yet, well, but we're well, getting I there. One, one last thing I want to say about it is, if you look at what developers want from the network, so when I when I joined Cisco, the first question I went out and asked all my developer friends was, what do you want from this? Nothing. Network? I got a chance to enforce it. They said, we want it to be invisible. Exactly. Yeah, we exactly. don't want to know. We don't want to see it. What developers want is they want a connection between point A and point B. They want a connection that probably has some policy applied to it that says, okay, I need a secure connection, whatever secure means, right? Or I need... I need a fast connection. It's a bandwidth, it latency, is. and security. Right? And so from, from those, that perspective, I think ultimately that's what a PaaS has to deliver, is the ability to say, okay, here's nice. component A, here's component B, or here's service A that you're consuming from the outside, or whatever it is. What is the policy that you want to apply to the connection between those two things, if anything? Or something along those lines, or something that could be um, implicitly defined that way. But, um, and that's really, it's that if looking at the abstraction from the developer perspective, that's what IT finds so hard. Because so much of IT operations has been about infrastructure operations, been about running data centers, running servers, running networks, running storage. And I think this is the big change that IT is picking up, is realizing that I'm providing a service. What does the consumer of my service need? The consumer of my service is developers in this case. 
and the, they look at the world in the following way. So how yeah. do I and, and the guy behind you has been, been part of this. You know, if we weren't open source, just to get back on topic, if we weren't open source, these organizations wouldn't have been able to stand us up, hack us, put it into place, and have running code as proof to then go and have that organizational change behind them. Right. Um, you know, I see you were mentioning over lunch about how that organizational change is an important part of this in addition to the technology. Yeah, so I think that, you know, the open source view of that is that we, because of that change, because it's so huge, because it touches so many areas, but we don't even know how to define open source becomes an important vehicle to make that change happen because, because we don't have the knowledge to know what's going to be the end game even. And if without open source, without the visibility, without understanding, without even different groups or different people not even talking to one another, being able to influence in that direction, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to uh, cross that barrier. And, and if each of you had to do that yourselves, if you had to build the paths yourselves, and if you didn't have a collaboration and a community behind it in an open source way, the, the adoption model would be ridiculously long. I mean, we would be stagnating, and their interoperability wouldn't exist. And we, you know, it is a complex, think of paths as a very, very complex application that IT, management, dev, everybody has to learn how to deal with and live with. And if you had to do that on an individual organization by organization basis, it just wouldn't happen. And so that's, that's where the open source pause comes into play. Cool. So on that note, um, we're pretty much out of time here. Oops. If you guys didn't like the panel, you should have tweeted me your questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for your time. All right. Thank you, bud.